Hey, it's Goal Oriented, Episode 3. I am your host, Chandler Engelbrett, and I'm joined by... Mason Young. And Austin Curtright. Guys, really happy we've made it now three weeks into a podcast. Before we dive into all things OU, uh, football-related, want to give some quick shout-outs. Number one, I- I'm always late with this. Shout-out to Justin Jane and Georgia Bomar holding us down here in the studio. Uh, this podcast doesn't, ha- doesn't happen without them, so thank you guys. But... There's also a shout out to Patrick Roberts of KGOU. Uh, he came in and upgraded our material here, and it is pretty nice. These I, I can hear myself talk in headphones. Um, pretty dope. Uh, but anyway, obviously this past weekend, OU defeated West Virginia 16-13. The score we all saw coming. Uh, definitely knew the game was going to play out that way. But uh, the biggest mode of the night happened about the second quarter I think a little over halfway through, um, fans decided to boo Spencer Radler. Um, didn't see that one on <laughs> coming this season at all. Was not on my bingo card for at any point this year. Mason, why don't we talk about that for a bit? Well, not only did the fans boo Spencer Radler, but they, the student section in particular started chanting, we want Caleb, um, calling for Caleb Williams, the freshman backup, hoping that Lincoln Riley would put him in to supplant Rattler. Um, and Rattler said after the game, you know, it doesn't bother me. I don't listen to them. Um, we're just out here to play our game or whatever. Um, but I, I, a lot of the perception is like, okay, maybe that that did bother him a little bit. We don't really know. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see how he responds to that moving forward. But like you said, definitely was not on on our bingo card to see Spencer Rattler uh, get turned on by the fans this early in a season where OU's offensive struggles haven't entirely been his fault. Yeah, it was a shocker, and I can think back to that moment, and now I'm going to throw it to you, Austin, being our verified Twitter account. You were tweeting everything that happened throughout the day. Um, when the fans started chanting, we what Caleb, what did you think of that moment? Take me through it. Yeah, so at first, I sort of similar to like the rest of the beat from the press box, I'm trying to understand what they started screaming, because it was pretty loud, and you know, later we deciphered that it was, you know, we want Caleb, and I found it pretty interesting um you know Spencer's obviously had struggles this season but it's 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 more compared to I think what the offenses of OU's past have been able to do why it's almost like OU fans have become you know accustomed to having a Heisman basically every season or a Heisman contender every season and as soon as a player doesn't have six touchdowns or run for have 400 total yards you know they're gonna be they're a little spoiled to that um, and, you know, back to the play, um, backup quarterback on a, at a school like OU is always going to be, you know, they always say, like, the most famous player on campus. Well, you know, it's always – when Jalen was here, it was, oh, Spencer can come in and play better. Or when Baker was here, it's like, oh, can't wait for next year with Kyler. Or now it's, you know, the backup of, of Rattler. And, you know, everyone's like, oh, I can't wait for Caleb Williams, the five-star, to come in. So, um, you know, unfair or not um, – it's just sort of one of those things that I think kind of started off as a joke just because Spencer's been getting hate this year, but kind of took off and people have ran with it. I, I want to go back to just talking about Spencer Radler in that moment as he had just thrown an interception. It was a pass that Lincoln Riley and Radler said after the game was not a bad pass. It was due to a miscommunication some point between stoops and he was supposed to go one way he went the other and then Radler still put the ball in a pretty good spot uh, but obviously they didn't go his way um what did you think of Spencer's overall performance on the game Mason yeah he was fine I think another thing to note on that play that you were just you were just elaborating on was if you examine how the routes are supposed to be run Jaden Hazelwood was had the vertical route there and supposed to keep going straight and because he didn't that allowed his cornerback to be in position to help the other defensive back make the play. It was a it was a tip, and then the other guy caught it. So there was kind of almost like two weird things that happened with the routes there. That's something they've obviously got to get cleaned up. But overall, Rattler, solid. I mean, I think the big critique of him right now is that he doesn't move very well outside the pocket, and that's going to be amplified when – offensive line struggles as much as OU's offensive line has struggled recently so um, I thought all circumstances given and also going against a really good West Virginia front that got a lot of pressure on him I thought he played pretty well um, you know I thought it, I thought it was interesting the 
conversation I had with his trainer, Mike Giovondo, after the game was, you know, and I think Lincoln Riley mentioned this too, like Spencer Rattler a year ago does not lead OU on that game-winning drive to get the field goal by Gabe Burgess to win the game. Like he just wouldn't have been mature enough to handle it. So I think we're seeing, like Lincoln Riley has talked about before, the maturation of Spencer Rattler, that he's finding ways to win in games where he doesn't throw for 400 yards and five touchdowns. I think it was very telling. You know, you just hit it there with just his maturation that he's had. Um, Rattler last year gets booze like that. Maybe doesn't uh, complete his last 15 of 16 passes and lead that final score, like you said. So I think that's sort of telling to to Spencer and you know how he's developed that he can respond like that after having a crazy moment like that. Yeah, but let's talk about that backup for a minute. Caleb Williams, like you alluded to earlier, five-star, number one quarterback in the country a year ago coming out of high school. He has a resume that suggests him getting into Lincoln Riley's offense. He would be very effective. Um, but in that moment, Mason just took us through it. That's a tough West Virginia team. That's a tough environment, even though you're on your home field. I don't know if Caleb Williams can lead OU to a larger victory. Maybe they get an extra touchdown, but I don't know if it's a bigger margin of victory in the long run. What do you think? Yeah, you could go a lot of different ways with that debate. I think the thing that people, a lot of people are trying to point to with the, the consideration of replacing Rattler with Caleb Williams is that Caleb Williams is faster. I mean, he really does have blazing speed. We saw him rip off like a 60-yard run against Western Carolina. So he is very fast, and when you have a good mobile quarterback that also has a strong arm, um, that that your the offensive line struggles aren't as amplified as they are with a guy who rat like Rattler who isn't as mobile as Caleb Williams. So he he brings some plus there on that side of the ball for OU. But we have to flash back to a year ago and look at where Rattler was as a redshirt freshman. It's two straight losses to Iowa State and Kansas State, caving in in the first half against Texas. I mean, like. The pressure on a young quarterback at University of Oklahoma with the expectations and also just being in a prolific offense with Lincoln Riley as your coach, that's a lot to handle. I don't know necessarily that Caleb Williams psychologically is ready for that while he may be ready for that skill-wise. I think if Lincoln Riley thought he was ready, then he would start Caleb Williams this week. I mean, obviously, I don't think he was going to bring him in against West Virginia because that would have been giving the crowd exactly what they wanted, and that would have shattered Rattler's confidence completely. But, you know, I don't I don't think Caleb Williams is ready for that, and I think Lincoln Riley knows it, and so that's why, you know, it's Rattler. He's going to continue to go with the quarterback that gives him the best chance to win, and whether people see it that way or not right now, it's Spencer Rattler. Austin, same question to you. I'm, I'm going to agree with Mason here. I just I don't doubt that Caleb Williams could step in right now and be productive and, you know, lead an offense, but I just think that with everything that Spencer's gone through last year and, you know, and this year, you know, they are 4-0. Um, OU obviously haven't had the prettiest wins, but Spencer's shown signs in games that have been, um, you know, pretty telling, whether it's the game-winning drive or, you know, responding after an interception or just being a leader. Um, I think that's, um, you know, something that's more important to this team than it is necessarily putting Caleb Williams out there right now. And, you know, what Lincoln said is, you know, they don't listen to the outside noise. They don't care how pretty their wins are. They just they're winning they're winning and winning's hard so they've said all year so um I, I wouldn't think that there's almost any chance of Caleb I mean Spencer Rattler would have to play really really bad Caleb Williams would have to show something for that switch to change and I think that you know as time goes on it it, it shouldn't be a problem they feel like they're pretty close to turning that corner offensively yeah, you mentioned the team having Rattler's back, and, and we saw that in the days afterward where Spencer would post on his on his Instagram a photo of him in the game, and, you know, it has some caption that, like, you know, he's like, I, I'm still going to do this. And his teammates come in, in the comments, and they're like, hey, man, we love you. You're great. Um, and that's exactly what you should expect from your teammates in that time. Um, I, for one, understand the booing. Um, I don't necessarily agree with it although I think fans can do whatever they want once they get into the stadium um as long as it's you know among the rules of what they can do um but when it comes to booing your own players I think it has to be very justified and if you look at Spencer Rattler's sats on the night like you said earlier he was like 26 of 36 250 yards a touchdown 
Um, they scored on four of their nine possessions. That's not the OU standard, but I don't know if it's booing worthy. Um, from there, kind of want to jump into what we learned today. Obviously, Lincoln Riley has his press every Tuesday. That's the same day we record this podcast. Mason, you and Austin went there, ate Midway Deli again. Um, I have class at that time, so that's not so clutch on my part. Uh, I miss Midway Deli, and I miss football content, so that's awesome. Um, but what did we learn today from the presser? Well, I think the thing that stands out the most from a news standpoint is the injury updates he gave. Um, linebacker Danny Stutzman, who's been out since the Western Carolina game with an arm injury, uh, they say is going to be a game-time decision against Kansas State on Saturday. Um, with the struggles that OU's linebackers have had, and I think that was magnified against West Virginia with the amount of passes that they allowed over the middle, um, Danny's a guy that they could really, you would hope, plug right back in, and he would have a major impact like he did the first two games um, when he was playing. So he could be a big returner for them. Also, uh, starting safety, Delarin turner Yell, who got injured the other night against West Virginia. Um, we were told his injury is not serious, and he's expected back. That's huge because he's one of the leading tacklers on the team, and he also had that interception the other night against West Virginia that was OU's lone turnover. So he really kind of sets the tone for that defense on the back end. I know they have Pat Fields back there as well, who's the team captain at the other safety spot, but DeLaren turner Yell is, is probably one of the more underappreciated players on OU's defense, so he's a big return um, for them against Kansas State for sure. And then the other thing is his freshman receiver, Cody Jackson, was a really surprising scratch um last week against West Virginia we were just like appalled and kind of confused that he just wasn't even at the game um and there's been some rumblings about maybe what the extent of his issue is and we're not sure what all that is right now but Lincoln Riley says medical issue he will not play against Kansas State this weekend so one down but it looks like they're getting at least one and maybe two back on defense and with the receiver depth that they have Cody Jackson's um, not being there doesn't hurt them that much. So uh, hopefully this is an OU team that's starting to kind of return to full health after kind of getting bit a little bit by the injury bug within recent weeks. Austin, outside of the Midway sandwich, what else did you see at the presser today Yeah, that, uh, you took note of? <laughs> um, something I found interesting was sort of talking about, you know, the wide receiver production. Um, you know, game one, it was Marvin Mims. Game two, it was sort of... Jaden Hazelwood and, and Mario Williams, and then you know Mike Woods emerged uh, with eight catches last Saturday against West Virginia. But um, with so many options at at receiver and sort of a you know a different passing attack that this OU team has, it's been really difficult for all of those guys to uh, you know sort of get their own touches. And that's something that Marvin Mims said is sort of frustrating at times. Even though he said that he just wants to do anything for this team to win, but you know. Marvin Mims leads the team in receiving and only has 10 catches in four games. And none of those receivers rank in the top 100 in receiving yards per game or receptions. And I just, it's it's pretty interesting to hear Lincoln say that, you know, Marvin's someone that we need to get the ball more. But, you know, at that expense, there's, there's so many guys that are getting the ball spread around so much. And, you know, he also mentioned that when you only have nine possessions or whatever the number was against West Virginia, that wasn't very high. You know, you're not going to get that many people the ball just in general. So that was something that um, I took away that I found was interesting from today. Yeah, um, I would say along all those things that we've mentioned, this team is still 4-0. And, and for some reason, it, it doesn't feel that way uh, a year ago. There's the conversation of if this was still the, te the same team it was a year ago playing today, what would their record be? Would it be two and two, one and three? What would that look like? Um, but this team, any way you look at it, they've still won every game. Um, this weekend they head to Manhattan, not New York, the one in Kansas, and they take on a team they haven't beat in two years. Um, so this is a, a perfect test for them right now. See how good this team is. Kansas State, obviously, is coming off a road loss to Oklahoma State, so I'm sure they're ready to get back home and play OU. But let's talk about Kansas State for a bit. Mason, what can you tell me about the Wildcats? Well, I think the key guy for Kansas State is uh, running back Deuce Vaughn. I mean, he was really kind of burst on the scene last year as a freshman, hurt OU in a lot of ways in that 38-35 come-from-behind loss in Norman. Um, he's a top 30 running back in the country right now in terms of yards per game. He's fifth in the Big 12, so 
he's among the premier running backs in the country, and um, OU has every challenge in front of them trying to stop him, and Alex Grinch even said as much today. So, Yeah, and another big one is uh, Skylar Thompson, who's been injured for Kansas State. It looks like he will, he's not going to play this Saturday. Um, and then their backup, Will Howard, who started against Oklahoma State, started the last few games, and Skyler's absence, um, he was hurt against Oklahoma State, left the game, so they uh, reverted to their third string. So not really sure if – we're not clear if uh, Will Howard's going to be back for the game against OU, but Skyler Howard, who's hurt OU you know, pretty badly in the last two seasons, is probably not going to be there. So um, that's a devastating loss for Kansas State and – I guess proves pretty well for OU's defense. Uh, I think it's interesting here because it feels like it's been uh, about five years since OU has not played in Norman. Uh, all four of their first games have been uh, obviously at Gaylord uh, Family Oklahoma Memorial Stadium, which is a name that's very long for some reason. But uh, I think this week it's a fun test uh, for this team. Let Let me ask you this. Do you think after this team gets booed, at home, um, obviously by its own crowd. Do you think they're wanting to get on the road and just get out of Norman for a minute? Do you think this is almost like a sigh of relief? It's like, okay, hey, they, they get to go on the road. What do you what do you think about that, Mason? Well, I think there's two sides to it. I think it's it's honestly kind of mixed. I think I think to your point, Chandler, like yeah, they could be kind of excited to get away from like the fans who at often times and over long periods of time have been rather ungrateful despite good football. I mean, like you said, like they're 4-0, and but you'd think they're 0-4 with how frustrated everybody on the outside is about them. So I think there is part of that that they could be excited about getting away. Um, the other side of that is like, yeah, you're going to you're gonna get railed by the, the Kansas State fans. Um and it's going to be a tough environment and a tough place to play a game. But I think it's a good test for them to show that they will not be rattled um, by the road atmosphere. And Lincoln honestly even said like a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him about it, he was like, I would have rather had a road game by now. Um, but they didn't get that with the two-lane game being moved, but now they're getting it. So, Well, either way, um, they, they get a road game now. Uh, and like we said, it's against the team that they have it, that has proven itself to be a worthy opponent against Oklahoma. Let's let's talk more about um, this game, Austin. What are your keys for an OU victory in this one? I think the keys are just you know doing what they've been doing. Really, I, it's it's Rattler staying composed, and you know he's he's gotten through these little lulls at home, but you know. Being able to stay composed on a road environment is a little different. Um, but, you know, with the way that OU's defense has been playing, it, it, I think it really just comes down to the offense playing with efficiency and the offensive line, you know, improving after last game. Um, you know, last game OU had its least amount of rushing yards it's had in a game since 2012. So I think, I think getting the running game involved in playing a conservative offense that can, you know, do just enough to – um, capitalize on the defenses with Rattler I think like we saw him throw for over 300 yards against this team last year I know he had the three interceptions like Austin said he's got to take care of the ball and not be like worried about the environment or anything like that but I think the big key is the receivers I mean I think this is an optimal time and an optimal opponent against which for OU to open up its playbook um, and throw the ball downfield a little bit more OSU seemingly did that pretty effectively against them in the first half and then use Jalen Warren, their running back, to kind of run the clock out in the second half. So I think we need to see OU do that this week. Really, um, Spencer Rattler connect with Marvin Mims a lot, get the ball downfield, score a lot of points in the first half, and then open up the running game and let Kennedy Brooks put it away. So Let's go back to Austin. Austin, you got anything else? You guys want to name a random Kansas State player that you remember? <laughs> well, I mean, last year – I didn't get credentialed for the game at home, so I was in the stands, and I was talking to A.J. Parker's parents, and he's from Bartlesville, Oklahoma, uh, and was a starting cornerback on that team, and now he is starting for the Detroit Lions as a rookie, so that's kind of cool. Hats <laughs> off to him, but like, I don't think I can name anyone else on Kansas State's current team besides no, Colin Klein. Every time I think about Kansas State, I think of Josh Freeman. I don't know why, but he threw for seven <laughs> touchdowns. Is that and I started him in fantasy when I was like 11 in a championship game, benched Peyton Manning, 
and this is like 2012. Threw for seven touchdowns. This worked. Won my fantasy league. Yeah, it did work because I'm a fantasy genius. You're zero and three right now in our league. <laughs> Enough random Kansas State players. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we got that derailed. Uh, but I, I would say my my key to the game for OU would be just managing Deuce Vaughn and limiting him. Uh, I, I think you both touched on that slightly. Um, but if you look back at at Vaughn's numbers from a year ago, in the running game, I think he only had about 35 yards. But at receiving, he had well over 100. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how uh, the, the Kansas State offense incorporates him into that. Um, but either way, I, I still think this game um, will still be close. Um, I, I I don't think any of us can predict OU wins a game by a blowout again, at least not at this at this rate. <laughs> um, but I, I would say OU has to adopt the same – with this offense, they have to adopt the same – um, mindset of, okay, we're going to try to go on a very long drive and, and try to work down a defense um, and, and keep their their defense off the field as long as possible. I think this one probably goes about 30-24 OU. That's my score prediction. Um, then I'll ride with that uh, until it's wrong, and then I'll say I got the, the score right. Um, but Austin, do you have a score prediction for this one? What are you thinking? None of us have been remotely close, so this number, like – doesn't matter at all probably because I'm not very good at this apparently but I'm gonna go 23 10 OU I'll go I'll go 40 27 OU and I say 40 because that's about the number of raviolis I'm gonna eat at Bella's Italian after the game have you been to Manhattan Kansas before no I just was looking up getting our hotel booked and all that stuff like that and I saw there's a Bella's Italian in Junction City where we're staying, and I think it'll be a nice little Italian restaurant. I also haven't had pasta in a while. so. <laughs> Austin, what are you looking forward to about Kansas? Uh, really nothing, to be <laughs> honest. Like, it's Kansas. <laughs> it's, it's literally Kansas. It's, it's uh, like Norman, Oklahoma, but, like, way worse, and there's nothing to do here already. So I don't really have high expectations. Covering the game will be fun. Um, driving, not so fun, but... Uh, we're going to get through it. Although I'm not driving up there, so I'm just going to literally sleep the entire way. Yeah, it's like a four-hour drive, right? Are we going to listen to Peach Pit in the car? We're absolutely going to listen to Peach Pit. If so, I'm putting my headphones on. Yeah, me too. I'm just going to sleep. But okay, I think it's about time to wrap up, but I have one more question. Let's say o- OU returns to Norman in two weeks uh, for homecoming, I believe. They take on TCU. But before that, they have to first handle the Wildcats, and then they have the Red River game. Let's say OU wins those games and wins convincingly. What's the reaction the crowd gives Spencer Rattler when he returns to Norman, knowing they just booed him two weeks ago? Mason, I'll go to you first. Uh, I think they're probably still going to chant, we want Caleb, and then when Caleb gets a starting job, they'll chant, we want Malachi. They're just, <laughs> they're just ungrateful. Like they don't, they don't appreciate what Rattler's trying to do with a struggling offensive line, ton of like new receivers and like really too many of them and then new running back near gray running back that hasn't played a year and kennedy brooks going behind that struggling offensive line i don't i don't see i don't see much changing i think ou fans are just like inherently ungrateful about some things and for some reason they've pegged spencer rattler as the next red bomar so austin i was trying to think of something funny to say to this but i couldn't but um <laughs> to be honest i think no matter what game it is, to start the game, OU fans are going to come in with level of excitement and be like, oh, this is going to be the different game that the offense turns it around, or this next game, OU's offense will turn it around. But I think to start the game, there's always that level of excitement, that level of you know pumping the sunshine there. And they're like, oh, yeah, Spencer Rattler, let's cheer him on when his name gets announced in the starting lineup. But um, you know, let's say he comes back and, and torches these next three games. I think people will almost forget that this even happened and – um, you know, OU would be what seven and zero at that point. I think OU seven and zero. I mean, Rattler torches these next games. Why wouldn't he be back on the Heisman watch? So, I, I think at that point it would become just an afterthought, and OU OU fans would be, you know, fully back to, you know, expecting the the huge offensive numbers that Lincoln Riley's used to putting up. Well, definitely wait and see. That has been the third episode of Goal Oriented. I've been your host, Chandler Engelbrett. You can follow me on Twitter at CT Engelbrett. Mason, how can they follow you? Yeah, my Twitter handle is at Mason underscore Young underscore zero. Hit me up with a follow. Mr. Verified, what about you? It is just at Austin Kurt Wright. 
and I have the most followers among all three of you. So if that means anything to you, you should follow me instead. <laughs> And that's been the third episode. Thank you so much for listening. Like I say, every week, please stay tuned to OUDaily.com for all your OU football needs. Uh, We'll be covering the Sooners throughout the season, um, and you won't want to miss any part of it. So thank you so much, and we'll see you next week. See ya. See ya.